them up and read. Uh, we've got a couple of children, so they can be dismissed to Children's Church. And uh, he, uh, Sheldon's going to be reading from the Gospel of John, and he'll be reading from chapter 10. morning if you can stand as we read the word of God today truly truly I say to you he who does not enter the sheep hole by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep to him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought out all his own he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let us pray. God, thank you for this day, the rain that we need. You know what we need and you give it to us. Thank you for uh, this congregation today and Pastor Ray, the sermon that he's going to bring from this word. You just bless each and every one of us as we go through this day. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, Sheldon. I titled uh, this morning's message, I Am the Door. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the fourth, third I Am statement that Jesus has made uh, that uh, John records. As you, recall, as you may recall, um, John has seven I Am statements that Jesus makes. Uh, the first I Am was G when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then the second one was, uh, I am the light of life. And we've dealt with those already. And so today, we're dealing with the statement where Jesus says, I am the door. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll, we'll uh, continue that same text and we'll be uh, in the text where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And uh, so, so you can see how they're progressing here. Now let's uh, talk about doors. Uh, it's really hard to imagine life without doors, isn't it? Uh, you know, we, we have doors for everything. And, and uh, you know, car doors keep you safe in the car so you don't fly out uh, when you're going around a corner. Uh, but especially important on a house. Uh, doors on houses are important. Why? Well, they keep people out. Uh, or they keep people in, or they also keep the cold air out, or keep the warm air in, and vice versa. And uh, doors are, um, are great. They're good for security, right? Um, we like security. Uh, but today, we're going to look at Jesus, who claims to be the door. Uh, and what is that door to? Eternal life, to heaven. So as we get to our, our text today, uh, we're going to explore, first of all, illegitimate access to heaven or illegitimate access to eternal life. Uh, Jesus began his dialogue in what appears to be the same context as the healing of the man born blind. And the reason I say that is because later uh, in the text, there's a comment about uh, the blind. So... So it seems like it's the same context. But you know, in the scripture, sometimes the, the stories are put together um, and, and yet they're not always chronological or even um, happen at the same, at the same venue. So, uh, but, but it appears that this one is uh, a continuation. And Jesus was using a metaphor in chapter 9 for blindness, right? That people needed spiritual sight. And 
And, uh, and so now he moves right into this new metaphor, which involves shepherding and sheep. And so Jesus told his audience, those that were standing around, that access to the sheepfold is through the door. And uh, in verse 1, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So what Jesus begins here in this, in this context to tell his listeners, and of course us as well, that any attempt to enter into heaven that is not through the proper means constitutes robbery, right, or thievery. And I want to talk about thieves for a, a little bit, right? Thieves uh, try to get in uh, by cunning. Uh, there, have you ever noticed that uh, they're always trying to find a way to get what they want? They're watching, they're looking for an opportunity, and uh, if you turn your head, they'll grab your phone, or they'll uh, sneak around, they'll pick pockets, right? You think about all the different ways that a thief will take what they want. Um, you know, when they go into a store, they stuff it in their, in their coat pockets, or in their shirt, or wherever, you know, that they can sneak and they're always looking for a way to get what they want by cunning. Uh, thieves always have an angle, right? There's an angle to everything that they do. And, uh, you know, and we think about thieveries and how do people want to get into heaven by thievery? I want to explore that for just a little bit. Um, well, oftentimes people bargain with God. Have you ever bargained with God, you know, and you just say to God, well, if you do this for me, I'll do that, right? And, and it's like the foxhole kind of a, a conversion. You're, you're bargaining with God. You're not really going to follow him, but it's just a, a way for you to get what you want. And that's really thievery because we're not submitting to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> but instead, we are trying to bargain with God. Or, or you might be trying to live a good life. And you just say, I'm just going to be good. And I'm just going, I never killed anybody, right? And, and you kind of... Uh, come up with ways to, to tell God, hey, I, I'm not such a bad person. Uh, you should let me into heaven. And I think a lot of people think that. And in their hearts, they are seeking to somehow appease God in some way in order to make some kind of amends in a way. You know, I'm going to just be good and then he'll let me into heaven for sure. Uh, and uh, but yet there's no submission to Jesus. They also try to get to God by uh, by means of other people. For example, uh, they pray to to saints or even to Mary, and they try to get get in that way. And they say, "Well, Mary, you know, you have it in with God." And so you pray to Mary, and Mary somehow will say, you know, you know, Ray over there, he's not such a bad person, uh, so you should let him in. You know, that, that's kind of the idea that people have about this praying to other people in order to get what they want. And so there's, there's all kinds of different ways that people try to get into heaven uh, by thievery. Or they might even think, I can just work my way to heaven. You know, I'll, I'll make sure that I do some good things for people and uh, walk the little old lady across the street and I'm going to make sure that uh, I'm kind to people and all those sorts of things. And all those things are a work that we are trying to earn our way 
into heaven. Other people try baptism and they'll they'll go through all the steps and they'll say, uh, you know, if I get if, just if I can get baptized, I'm going to be in. And uh, they'll try to get in there uh, that way. And that's that's thievery too, because it's not a submission to Jesus, but instead it is uh, a way that we can work our way into heaven. Another way that people do it is they try just religion in general. They're, they're not real specific about the religion that they go after. They just say, well, as long as I'm religious. Have you ever heard that people say, well, as long as they're sincere in their belief, God will accept their sincerity. Even if they're wrong, God will, they're sincere. So, so God should accept whatever it is that they're doing. And, uh, and all these things that Jesus is calling uh, theft. He's saying this is not the way to get into heaven. This is not the way to get eternal life. This is not the way that we are going to uh, attain to a relationship with God. So Jesus calls their way and every other way theft. But he also, you might notice in the same verse, he says... The same is a thief and a robber. And I wanted to talk a little bit of difference between a thief and a robber. For example, a thief will, will come in and they'll, they're usually underhanded in the way that they take things. Uh, but a robber is a little bit different because a robber, um, usually there is violence involved with a robber. And, uh, and we can look at verses 9 and 10 and we can see how that Jesus spells that out a little bit for us. He says, Most assuredly I say to you that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way is the same as a thief and a robber. The thief does not come, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So you see that the robber is, is someone who comes in by violence. Um, years ago, when I was still single, and uh, I had set up a little apartment, getting ready to get married, and uh, so I moved into this little apartment down in uh, San Fernando Valley. Uh, if you know anything about San Fernando Valley, it's a good place to be from. Uh, you don't want to live in San Fernando Valley. In fact, the, the day before I was getting married, my parents were visiting, and there was some guy tripped out on some sort of drug with a, with a pipe about yay long, and he's beating it all over the place in the parking lot of the apartment building next door. So that's not a good place to be. Well, I came home from work one night, and I used to work night shift, and I got home about 1 a.m. And the front door to my apartment was open. And I walk in and I thought to myself, you know, this, there's something wrong. But I couldn't, I, I, it was like unbelievable, right? It's like, how could this be living in San Fernando? How could, <laughs> how could this be somebody would break into my apartment? And, uh, and they ransacked my apartment. And uh, they stole a bunch of stuff. So a thief and a robber, they broke into my house. And uh, how, how do people try to rob their way into heaven? Well, they think that uh, like, the, like the Muslims do, right? That they can blow themselves up and a whole bunch of other people. And, uh, you know, with a, with a you know, uh, suicide bomb. And that's going to earn them some sort of way into heaven and that and their their religious people tell them hey this is this is one way that you can guarantee entry into heaven that's a that's a violent act isn't it and and it's not going to get anyone into heaven violence is not the way to enter into heaven another way that people try to get into heaven is by not listening to jesus now, Jesus is, is 
pouring his life into the people and they're just not listening to him. And, and it comes out in the next few verses, in verses 3 uh, through 5. It says, To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings, them, brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So here is a great example in the opposite, right? Where the sheep hear the Savior and they follow him, but in opposite is they don't listen to the Savior. They, they don't follow him. They are, are like strange sheep, right? They're, they have no idea about what Jesus is saying. That means that they're not part of the family of God because they are not following his voice. And those who know the shepherd, of course, will follow him, will, will obey him. They will uh, do what Jesus is saying. Now, there was a man by the name of William James. He says, he says this, when you, when you have to make a choice and don't make it, that is a choice in itself. So uh, another way that people are uh, uh, trying to get into heaven uh, by thievery or robbery is doing nothing. They do nothing, right? They just say, whatever I'm doing, it's good enough. And I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. But this is what Jesus talked about in uh, John 3, 18. It says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what we have here is a situation where where uh, you're already condemned. It's a do-nothing kind of a scenario where you are, are uh, just oblivious to the fact that you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. And so people often put off a decision to follow Jesus because they go, well, I still have things to do. My life is good the way it is. I don't want to make any changes. I enjoy going and partying or I enjoy this or I enjoy that. And if I follow Jesus, then I would have to obey him. And I don't really want to do that. So it's a do nothing kind of a scenario. So you have all these different scenarios, uh, but the do-nothing is probably the worst because a, a person is thinking somehow in their mind that God is going to give them another chance, that somehow along in their life that, that things are going to eventually come along and then they're going to say, okay, I think I'll give my life to Jesus here at the very end of my life. But the problem is, is that the, the longer you go, the harder it is to come to Jesus because you get entrenched in the, the way that you have been going all these years and it just gets harder and harder. And the hardest thing is to actually admit that I need to humble myself and put my faith and trust in Jesus. So... So here we, uh, we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you uh, not to receive the grace of, of God in vain. But he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the, time, the day of salvation. So, what this says to us is that we should never put off um, our, our following Jesus to any other time, but to follow him today and, and, uh, and not say, someday I'll do that. You know, it's like the New Year's resolution, right? 
New Year's is coming, and so people say, well, when New Year's happens, then I'll make this, this or that change. And I realized years ago that it doesn't matter what day you start, right? And I realized that I need to start, like, whenever it came to my mind, I don't got to put it off. I'm going to start today. And, and if I put it off, it probably won't really happen. And it's not something I'm really fully committed to. And I needed to make a decision to follow Jesus today. So what, are all the, what do all religions have in common? And, the, and what they all have in common is that they all have a way, their own way, to get to God. Every religion that you would study, any religion that you look at, is going to have a way to get to God. That if we, uh, if we begin to, to uh, analyze each one, none of them follow Jesus' way. All of them are false religions, and all of them are, are trying to get in either by thievery or robbery or whatever. They're not the way that Jesus said is the only way to follow him. What's interesting is that some of the cults today will use Jesus as a front. Have you ever noticed, right, that, that there is... Uh, Jesus is used in their literature and they talk about Jesus, but they're really truly not following the, the Jesus of the Bible. And we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, where, where the Apostle Paul warns the, the Corinthians to watch out for people that are trying to masquerade as something that they're not. Look at, look at what it says here in verse 3. But I fear, lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if, we, if he who comes preaching preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you received a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. And that's exactly what's going on in, uh, in some of these cults that use the name of Jesus, but they mean different things by what they're saying. For example, uh, the, the Latter-day Saints, they, they have a different definition for grace uh, they have a different definition for salvation. They have a different definition for even for Jesus. So what is LDS, right? Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. Or Jesus, uh, <laughs> but they put Jesus in the name of their cult. And yet, if you dive into who they say Jesus is, Jesus is just a person who became a God. It's not God who came down in the flesh. It's someone who became a God. And they teach that you too can become a God. And so if you say that Jesus is the creator of the universe, they go, yes, this God, Jesus is the creator of this universe. But there's many universes and many creators of many universes. And you see how they can twist the truth of God's word and try to, you know, redefine the terms and, and try to, uh, to, to bring you to think that there's something in you that you can attain the same kind of level that Jesus obtained. See, Jesus could get there. You too can do the same thing. That's thievery or even uh, robbery. They're trying to get to God on their own terms. Uh, take, for example, the Jehovah Witness, for example. They teach also that Jesus is just a man. He's just a person. And... and and there's, there's God, and then there's Jesus, and, 
and they really they talk about Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible who says, I am the only way, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So all these cults who claim Jesus or even use the Bible, have you ever noticed how that they'll, they'll twist the Bible to mean what they want it to mean? Why do you think that they use the King James translation? Because it's hard to understand, Right? It's not a bad translation, but it's just hard to... These and thous and all that, it, and the language is difficult. Did you know that the King James Bible was written to a, a 12th grade uh, language level? So, so you know, if, if you're not, like, thinking college level, you're going to be having... You're going to struggle with not only the concepts, but... And, and the wording and, and everything, you're going to struggle to understand what the word means. And so, so it's this, they use the King James and then even the Jehovah Witness, they, they say that they have the King James. But then what they've done is they've created their own translation of the Bible, which perverts the words of Jesus and, and the word of God. And they change the word so that it, mean something different so all these right they're coming they're trying to cunningly get into your heart and draw you away from the truth of the word of god now think about and i'm picking on everybody now uh and, and it's important that you know this because i don't know that you know that everybody really thinks through what is really going on in these cults because they'll say oh we're all christians you're a christian i'm a christian we're all christians no there's a huge difference between that and and it used to really bother me when i was a kid and i was studying uh, history and uh, they would they would refer to the catholics as christians and i would say they're not christ followers they believe that Jesus died and that he was buried and that he rose again. But you know what they add to the Bible? They add works. So in order to be saved, yeah, it's all good that Jesus did all these things on the cross, but you have to work your way to heaven. You have to uh, do the, the mass and you have to do the, the, uh, the baptism and you have to do all these things, and, which they call... Um, sacraments. A sacrament is something that that is uh, um, that imparts grace. So when you do that, you receive grace from God. We're going to do the the communion a little bit later in the service, but this is not a sacrament. It's an ordinance, and the difference is that the ordinance is something that Jesus ordered uh, for us to do as a remembrance. Right? They are memorial services of what Jesus has done, not in order to receive grace. So we're not receiving grace by any kind of a work. So, so uh, the Latter-day Saints and uh, the Jehovah Witness, they detract from the gospel. It's another gospel. The Catholics add to the gospel. It's another gospel. The gospel is just plain and simple believe that jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin and that involves repentance right that we're that we realize that we're sinners and that jesus died to pay for our sin and that we put our faith and trust in him alone for our salvation not in anything else that might detract from the actual gospel so now that i've picked on those i want to pick a little bit more I, I, I'm not satisfied to just stop with the, the, the people who claim Jesus somehow in their religion. We can talk about the Eastern religions. And most of them, like the Buddhists and, and even some of the Hindus, would actually ascend to the, to the idea that Jesus was a prophet. And they would consider his his sayings on a par with with buddha and confucius and some of those but but do they believe what jesus said no 
Because Jesus says, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So all religions have some element that they just kind of throw in there that may or may not be, uh, you know, near the truth, but it's always twisted. It's twisted in such a way that people are led away from the truth of Jesus and are, are uh, going their own way. So if we were to pick on the, the Muslims, for example, and of course this is online, uh, if we were to pick on them, they took the Bible and they twisted it and it was a, it was a Catholic priest that influenced Muhammad who, and the Catholic priest that influenced Muhammad was a heretic and cast out of the Catholic Church. So he had some ideas that were clearly wrong from the Catholic perspective and not even over to Christianity, the true followers of Jesus. And he twisted that and taught Muhammad which made up a whole new religion. And if you, if you know anything about their religion, what you find is that they took what the Bible says and they turn it upside down. Just in the end times, when we think about what, when, when Jesus talks about the Antichrist, or not Jesus, but when John writes about the Antichrist, they take the Antichrist and say, he's the Christ. And when Jesus comes, he's the Antichrist. It's all twisted. Can you see what, what's going on here? It's thievery and robbery trying to get to God a different way. It's trying to, to manipulate people to believe that somehow they're okay with what they're believing. When the truth is so plain and simple that they miss the point. And I want to even consider the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were following Moses. But this is exactly what Jesus was addressing, that they're, even they're following Moses, they say they're following Moses, but if Moses were alive at the time, Moses would be following Jesus and they were trying to kill Jesus. You see the irony of this? They're following a man who would follow Jesus, but they're not really following Moses because if they had been following, really following Moses, they would have believed what Moses said about the Messiah and they would have believed in him. So all of it, all of it, and Jesus is talking to the Pharisee audience of the day and he says, you're trying to get in by thievery and robbery. And it should really help us to understand the gravity of not following Jesus on his terms. When we try to follow Jesus on our own terms, we will miss the mark. That's what the word sin means, missing the mark. And so we miss the mark completely and we all fall short of the glory of God. So the big question that I have for you to this morning is are you trying to get into heaven on your own terms? Is there something in your life that you're holding on to that isn't part of the plan of God and, and how we can be saved? And if there is, you need to submit to Jesus as the only way to to life, to eternal life. So now that we've talked about the illegitimate access to heaven, now we can talk about the legitimate access to heaven or legitimate access to eternal life or a relationship with God. You can fill in the blank on that last change heaven to whichever one of those synonyms you'd like. But the only legitimate access to salvation is through the door. And that door is Jesus. Uh, follow along in your Bibles um, in ver from verse 3 through verse 9. I want to read that whole context and we'll talk through that. It says, to, hi to him, the gatekeeper, 
sorry, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and, he, and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but get this, right? But they did not understand the things that he spoke to them. Then Jesus said again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who enter... All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, now when, you, when you see what Jesus is saying in its entirety, we're going to tear this apart a little bit and look at the, the various aspects of it. Well, a door, as we mentioned at the entry, at the beginning, is a door gives access, but it also is a door of safety, right? Uh, and uh, when Jesus is talking here about the door, he's talking about a pen where the sheep would spend the night. There's, it's like a gated area where the sheep would go in through the one gate or door. And most of these sheep pens had no actual physical door. And uh, so what would happen is it was an enclosure and uh, just an, a small opening. And the shepherd would bring his sheep into the pen. And as he went, as all the sheep went in, then he would spend the night as the door so the shepherd would lay in the door and the sheep would not go out because they were uh, they were inside and the shepherd was there at the door and so they would realize that well, it's not time to go out uh, shepherd uh, sheep are kind of kind of um, uh, simple and so here they are right uh, protected by the shepherd so the idea is now they're, they're, st they're in this nice little pen and they're in, in the protection of the shepherd. So they're watching the sheep and everything. Now a thief will come and they're not going to go through the door. Why? Because there's somebody standing there or sitting there. Um, they're not going to come that way. They're going to come over the fence, grab a sheep, and go out. Right. That's how the thievery and robbery happen, right? So, 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 so now you can start to see the picture that Jesus is drawing here for his audience. And he begins by saying, look, there's, there's this pen and he is the access, the legitimate access is bringing the sheep in, bringing them out, goes through the door. And he uses the, the illustration here where he says the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. So back to verse 3. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the doorkeeper, who is that? Well, that's Jesus, right? And he's using this illustration in two different ways. One as the shepherd who goes in and out. But also he's using the illustration of the shepherd being the doorkeeper who lets the sheep in and lets the sheep out. So, <clears throat> doors are made for people or things to go in and out. Windows are made for light to come in or, or air to come in, but people don't generally go in through a window. Uh, if someone is going in through a window, there's something wrong, right? There's the doors locked and they're trying to get back in, uh, but most of the time when somebody goes through a window, it's illegitimate. It's something that isn't meant to be that way. So, so these, the shape of a door is made in order for people or things or sheep to go in and out. 
So then in verse 9, Jesus makes it really clear because they didn't understand what Jesus was saying up to this point. They're confused. And so Jesus then, at the very end of in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Access to God, access to heaven, access to eternal life are only through Jesus. There's no other way to get there. And I want to draw your attention to the I am statement, this third I am statement. And it comes here in verse 9. When Jesus says, I am the door. What he is referring to, and we've talked about this already two, two previous times, is that when he uses this term, I am, it should help his readers to understand that he's referring to God and God's proper name when he said to Moses, I am, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So Jesus is identifying himself with the great I am of the Old Testament. And uh, the reason we know that is because <clears throat> in this very statement, by saying, I am the door, he's saying, in effect, I'm God, and you can only get in if I let you in. Right? If he's God, he has the right to let you in. But if he's not God, he doesn't have the right to let you in. You can't get in to heaven if he's not God. Because it's God who pays the penalty for our sin on the cross. He does that in order to forgive you of your sin. Jesus, could, if he wasn't God, he could not forgive you of your sin. And nothing that he did would would help you whatsoever if he wasn't God. All it would do was he would pay, quote unquote, pay for his own sin. And he's sinless, obviously, and Jesus didn't sin at all. And therefore, because he's God, he can pay for your sin too. And that's the beauty of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're working together, one God, three persons, to bring about salvation for all of us. So there's no other way but through Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, I am the door. He's not saying I'm one of the doors or I'm going to give you access to something that I don't have a right to do. He is actually giving us access to God because he is God. So he stands in the doorway and welcomes those who trust in him. There's no back door. When I was, uh, you know, working in computers, <clears throat> uh, there was this thing that was going around, and it probably still is. It's called the back door. Have you ever heard of a back door in, com in computer programming? The back door is the programmer is the only one who knows how to get into the software, into the program by this back door. He's the only one who's got the code, so to speak, and he can get in and do whatever he needs to do in that, in that program. And so he has some sort of a password. When I was a programmer, we had a back door that we used in order to fix problems in the computer software of the, or the data of the computers that were there. So we would go in with this back door and we would change the data that needed to be changed because it was wrong and it was easier to do it that way than to go through all the rigmarole that was, was there. So, but there's no back door to heaven, is there? There's only one way, and that one way is Jesus. And God prescribed the one way. Now think about how that in, in biblical history there was a... A, a situation where there was a door, one door to get in. Can anybody tell me what that is? The ark. Right? Noah built an ark, and how many doors did it have? One door. One door to get into the ark. And, and uh, so God prescribing the, the ark, he says, you shall make windows for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door 
of the ark in its side. Not the doors, plural, the door, singular. And, and so people needed to enter in by the door to be, slave, to be saved from the flood that destroyed every living creature that was not on the inside. And so God was the one who shut the door. That's, that would have been amazing to be inside the ark and God is the one who shut the door. That's what it says in Genesis 7, 16. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. There was a Hollywood movie a few years back. And I hope you didn't go see it. I watched it because I, I, people were talking about it. And I thought, I got to know what people are talking about. Complete heresy about Noah's flood. I think it was just called Noah's flood or something like that. I don't know. Or Noah. Or, but you know, <laughs> they had a stowaway. Nimrod, who's named in the Bible, he, he stood away on the ark, made trouble for them all, right? And uh, I think he made it to the end. I can't remember now. But what? He snuck on the ark. Nobody sneaks on the ark, right? Welcome him in. Come on in. There's plenty of room. Uh, you want to come? Legitimately great, but there's no stowaways on the ark of, of uh, Noah's ark. And there's no stowaways in heaven either. They only come in by invitation. And Jesus invites us to follow him. So how to, fo how to follow the shepherd through the door? Let's go back to verses uh, 2 through 5 in verse 9. It says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he begins, when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. And in verse 9 it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So what this is telling me is that the only way to get in the pen is to be one of Jesus' sheep who hear his voice and follow him. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus as our shepherd, he will let us in to heaven. No other way. Jesus, Jesus' sheep follow him and we're not swayed by false teachers. You'll see right through the charade of the false religions. You'll see right through the, 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 this beautiful facade that says, oh, we have the way because they don't have Jesus as God come down in the flesh who died on a cross to pay for your sin. And if you repent and put your faith and trust in him, you're saved. Nothing else. Now, works don't save us, but what they do is they show that our hearts are changed. And so we do the works, but not to be saved, because if we attach our works to salvation, we are not saved. It's not true salvation. So what does he require of us? Well, he requires that we confess our sin and believe that Jesus died for our sin as it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you, first of all, that, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day 
according to the scripture. And then we ask him to come into our life and save us because it says in Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God will change our life from, from the one who's prideful, trying to do it on our own, to a humble and trusting in Jesus alone as our Lord and Savior. There is no other means for salvation. Jesus is the only way to heaven, and don't try to get in to heaven any other way. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your word this morning, a great reminder of how that we can be saved by following Jesus alone. Thank you, Lord, for uh, even including this in your word so that we could uh, study how that other people Others are trying to get in in an illegitimate way. Help us uh, to focus on you and what you're doing in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please put your faith and trust in him today. Talk to someone. But I want to transition to the Lord's table. Uh, hopefully you do have one of these little uh, um, communion cups uh, if you don't you can just slip back there and and grab one real quick uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the passage in first first Corinthians chapter 13 or sorry chapter 11 and uh, we'll be um, talking about the communion now communion is obviously as I said earlier not a sacrament uh, it is an ordinance and uh, and this was was given to us as a memorial the the elements don't become the body of Jesus or the blood of Jesus as you take them that's what the Catholics say it becomes uh, the body and blood of Jesus you know what's wrong with that it it just we're killing Jesus every time we take communion it's like Jesus dies over and over and over and over and over again every time. Jesus died once for all. And what we're doing here is remembering and celebrating something that happened in the past as a memorial, but also as a reminder of what he did so that every day we are reminded that, that we're only here by, by God's grace. We're not getting grace, but we've already received it and we're we're only saved because of what jesus did on the cross and so we'll never forget and and also the other thing about it that we do it together it's something that is done corporately and the reason it's done corporately is because we are all in agreement so so it's it's communion is what we call it the lord's table communion why because you and you and you and you and you and me, we all believe that Jesus died on a cross to save us. And so this only has significance for those who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we don't come to the table, we don't come to communion on our own terms. We come on Jesus' terms. And one of the things that he, that he says in his word, he says uh, in in. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So this is why we come to the Lord's table with our hearts prepared. We come to the Lord's table with our hearts prepared receptive and yielded to what God is doing in our life. That means obedience to his word. That means obedience to Jesus, the, sh the, the shepherd, right? The door. He is the one that we are following and he is the one who wants us to live a righteous life before him. So I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you've got any unconfessed sins, to, to confess those right now. Because sometimes we, we don't think about you know, 
our life so much, but this is a time of reflection. We need to think about what, it, what did Jesus really do for me? He, he paid for my sin. And then I'm going to give you just a moment to do that, to just confess any and confess sins. And then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and pray for the, the bread that we are about to partake. Lord, I want to thank you for your mercy. I want to thank you for your grace that you've bestowed on us that have put our faith and trust in Jesus. And, and Lord, we don't want to take that lightly. And Lord, we thank you that you've heard our prayers, that you've uh, heard the, uh, us the confession. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know, Lord, that you have done that already in the past. And all our, all our sin is paid for in full. But yet we come with, to you wanting clean hands. And Lord, we thank you that you have washed our hands. And our hearts are already clean, but our hands may be dirty. And Lord, I thank you for uh, hearing our prayers. And Lord, I want to pray right now for the bread that represents your body that was broken. Uh, Lord, we can't even imagine what you went through on that cross. And yet, Lord, we are thankful uh, that you did that for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You could take the wafer off the top of your little cup there. And uh, hold it for just a moment, and I'll read a couple of verses here from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat the bread together. I'd like to pray for the, the cup at this time. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the cup that represents your blood that was shed on the cross. And Lord, we, we realize that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Lord, we, we are grateful that your blood was shed on our behalf. And Lord, we are sorry that we are uh, sinners and that your blood needed to be shed in the first place. But yet, Lord, in your grand plan, you did this for us. And Lord, we are grateful to you. And Lord, thank you for this cup that represents your blood. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We take the, the cup, and it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's drink it together. Can you imagine what the, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be like? It won't be a little tiny cup and a little wafer, it's going to be a banquet. Uh, and uh, wow, that, I'm looking forward to that. I know the Lord will come soon. Uh, before I, I pray and dismiss us, I just want to remind you that there's an offering plate on the very back table, not the one in the middle, but the one in the very back. And that's our benevolence offering. Our deacons use that for uh, people in our church that have um, specific needs and so if you'd like to give towards that fund uh, please do that don't forget the other offering boxes for your regular offerings uh, and uh, gifts to the Lord for our church so uh, to be used for our church so uh, with that um, let's uh, 
have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Lord, thank you once again for loving us and caring for us. And Lord, as your people go forth into the mission field, I pray that we would be bold in proclaiming the true Jesus of the Bible uh, and that we would be bold in telling people that you are the only way into heaven. Thank you, Lord, for, for each and every one that's here today. And Lord, we also want to just remember those that are sick today, and I pray that you would just uh, bring recovery to their, to their bodies, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.